Hey everybody, uh, most of you got a chance to meet me yesterday. My name is Luke Biker. I work with Fish and Wildlife Service out of the Anchorage Field Office. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about a project I actually completed when I was with Fish and Game on the Kenai on introduced Alaskan blackfish and their impacts on native fish assemblages. Um, this project is actually more pertinent to the Matsu Valley than it was to the Kenai, so I've been wanting to give this presentation for a while now. Um, See, so yeah, you all saw my introduction yesterday. I'm with the Habitat Restoration Branch out of the Anchorage Field Office now. So the summer that I started this project, this Netflix documentary came out, and I didn't own a television at the time, so I was really confused why people wanted to talk to me about SeaWorld. But we're talking about the fish on the right, not orcas. So a species profile, really neat fish. Uh, Alaska blackfish same, share the same order with pike. Um, there's the family Umberdae, shared with a few other species, none of which are in Alaska. Um, they grow four to 12 inches in length. I'd say five inches is pretty good average. Uh, and then juveniles, of course, quite a bit smaller. Um, and the prime habitat for them is really pretty um, identical to pike, really slow moving, organic, heavy water. They don't have a great tolerance for fast current. So they have really unique adaptations. This is what makes them the most cool. So they have um, a modified eso esophagus to breathe atmospheric oxygen. So an esophagus that essentially acts as a lung they can breathe air in uh, anoxic environments. Um, widen mouth and underbite to inhale prey and scoop prey from the mud. Rounded pectoral and caudal fins are an ambush predator, not unlike pike, uh, just for short bursts of speed. Um, they can survive in wet mud during periods of drought. So when wetlands dry up, they can survive for quite a while just in the mud, breathing air. Um, awesome study of Denali, Denali National Park. They found um, ponds that were so full of methane, they were completely anoxic. And blackfish survive the winter by breathing air out of muskrat holes. Um, so they can survive entirely without dissolved oxygen. Uh, another great one out of Cheney Lake when they were trying to poison out pike a number of years ago. Um, the pike, excuse me, they wrote known the lake for pike and the blackfish survived the wrote known treatment. Um, presumably by breathing air or by burying themselves in the mud. Um, so they're extremely resilient, specially evolved fish. So here's kind of the contentious part of the presentation. So their native range is outlined in brown. Uh, they are an important um, subsistence food in western Alaska. Um, and then they're definitely introduced to Anchorage and the Kenai. It's sort of a source of contention whether or not they're introduced to the Matsu. Um, all the anecdotal data I've been able to find is that they were introduced around the 50s, but I'd be curious if there's some traditional ecological knowledge to show they were here longer. Um, they are a cryptic species, so it's possible they existed here for quite a while um, before anybody detected them. So introduced range, again, the Matsu is kind of contentious. Um, they're in a lot of the stock lakes in the Anchorage Bowl, um, and then a very small population in the lower Kenai River that's pretty isolated. So that one's definitely introduced. Uh, Matt Bowser with the Kenai Refuge um, was able to put together this haplotype map for me um, to try and get some clues of where blackfish might have come from. Um, the ones on the Kenai originated from western Alaska. Interestingly, only three samples from um, the Matsu, but they had the closest ties to another introduced population out in St. Lawrence Island. Um, so again, it, you know, the evidence points to that they were introduced in the Matsu, but it's not entirely conclusive. So this was my study area on the Kenai. We had uh, Walmart, Walmart Creek um, is stream B there, and then Golf Course Creek is stream A. Those are the only two known anadromous streams where there are blackfish on the Kenai. Um, and then I used three different control streams uh, that are immediately adjacent. And um, yep, and both streams are tidally influenced in their lower reaches, which, you know, black, um, blackfish cannot tolerate salt water, so that's kind of hemming them in, so to speak. Um, so I used, I used two different methods to analyze my fish trapping data. I'm not going to talk about the fault and condition factor today. That was uh, focused on juvenile coho. So I'll just move past that. But um, I used catch per unit of effort um, uh, to analyze my trapping data just to use as an index of abundance on how abundances of different native fish changed once blackfish invaded. So the two-year catch per unit effort data, um, three-spine stickleback. Uh, saw a pretty rapid decline anytime blackfish were around. Uh, black, or excuse me, three spines are pretty much in anywhere there's wet on the Kenai, you're probably going to find three spine stickleback. And they disappear pretty quickly with the introduction of blackfish. 
Um, as well, there were some anomalies with a lack of Dolly Varden, although I think that's less um, compelling than the three-spine stickleback. And then also, three-spine sticklebacks were only caught in blackfish streams during spring spawning, and I never caught any resident stickleback for the entirety of the summers. Um, Dr. Michael Bell of Stony Brook University, Rob Massengill hooked me up with him. Uh, he's done 20 plus years of stickleback genetic research here in Alaska. Uh, a lot of it, or actually most of it, out in the Mat Sioux. Um, so he was able to provide me this, yeah, I mean, nearly 20 years of data. Um, and you can see stickleback populations as blackfish rise, uh, take a big dip, things stabilize for a while, and then another big dip. So that's Rabbit Slough, Tomlinson Lake, um, same phenomenon. Um, so, you know, and there's some correlation with juvenile coho as well, or rather some onids in this case. So dietary overlap, um, 2016 study on blackfish diet in the Anchorage Bowl. So this is in stock lakes, not anadromous, so not as useful. But um, oh, sorry, I'm talking about the uh, and a 2016 study on rearing salmon gut, gut contents in the Susitna River revealed that there is dietary overlap in three of the top ten gut contents. Um, but blackfish diet is pretty much focused year round on benthic uh, food sources whereas juvenile salmon shifts to terrestrial food sources for at least part of the year. So there's only a degree of dietary overlap between juvenile salmon and blackfish, but there is some. So I had a lot of hypotheses for the reduced uh, abundance of three-spine three stickleback. Um, there is a greater degree of dietary overlap. It was hard to find a lot of data, um, actually from North America for that matter, on um, uh, the diet of three-spine stickleback. But what I was able to find, there was a great degree of uh, dietary overlap, so that could be one reason that we see the decline. Um, direct predation. Uh, blackfish diet is not heavy in fish but it, um, in terms of frequency, but it is heavy in terms of mass, looking at uh, different um, gut content studies on blackfish. So it's certainly possible that they're predating on them. Um, and that, uh, sticklebacks are both resident populations and anadromous. My, my work suggested that I was only catching the anadromous life form of stickleback, and so the resident uh, population was pretty well wiped out in the blackfish streams. Um, life stages of vulnerability. Stickleback actually spawn in prime um, blackfish habitat, unlike salmon. And so I think there's a, there's a pretty compelling case that uh, there's a direct predation at some point in the stickleback life cycle. Blackfish are limited to, um, I think it's five or 10 millimeter prey size, so you know, salmon aren't nearly as vulnerable, but juvenile sticklebacks definitely would be. Um, hypotheses for reduced uh, catch of Dolly Varden. I, I think this is a lot less compelling, but there is more dietary overlap between um, Dolly Varden than there is with juvenile salmon, so that's certainly a possibility. Um, direct predation. Um, you're, in the blackfish streams, I tended to find Dolly Varden only in the fall um, yeah, pretty much exclusively in the fall. So that suggested to me those were anadromous Dolly Varden, um, and I didn't catch uh, any resident Dolly Varden in most of the streams. Um, so that could be another case where juveniles are being predated on. Certainly larger Dolly Varden are not being predated on by blackfish. So it's not like the smoking gun of pike, you know, that are just full of juvenile salmon. It's, it's not quite that simple with blackfish. Um, but there are some life stages of vulnerability, particularly with uh, Dolly Varden. So everybody wants to know, okay, what about salmon? You know, stickleback are great and all. Um, so uh, the, I, in my opinion, there's a lack of habitat overlap during vulnerable life stages. So salmon are spawning, of course, in clean, uh, relatively fast flowing spawning gravel. Um, and whereas blackfish are living in these organics heavy, uh, weed choked streams that are often, you know, don't have a lot of oxygen, um, not, not prime spawning habitat. So I think there's a, when juvenile salmon are vulnerable to blackfish, the two are not likely to overlap. So I think there's a pretty limited case that blackfish uh, predate directly on salmon. Um, like I said, there's a limited dietary overlap. There certainly is some. And, um, and blackfish habitat would primarily only overlap with juvenile coho salmon. But again, during the egg, alvin, and, and um, brand new fry size of salmon, they, they likely wouldn't overlap. So I think there's, yeah, I just don't think that there's a lot of blackfish predation directly on salmon. 
So um, I have a lot of, a lot, a lot of sources. It's just easy, easier to uh, send me an email, and I can send you my paper and then um, all the other uh, papers that I cited. But uh, the shout out that I have is for Rob Massengill. He was an awesome um, mentor through this and gave me a lot of uh, good information. And, and he got me Dr. Michael Bell's number, which if you ever want to learn about Stickleback, he's your guy. Um, and then, uh, yeah, this is really, and I also like to thank my boss, Brian Blossom, at that time for uh, letting me pursue this side hustle, you know. Um, yeah, but thank you. You got any questions? Andy? So some of the harvests I've seen out in western Alaska, I mean, people are pulling up traps just full of these blackfish. Um, like the Walmart Creek in Kenai, uh, when you go out and put your traps out, are you pulling up hundreds of fish? Or are you pulling up just dozens? Um, yeah, on a good trapping day with, you know, six, six to eight traps, yeah, you might catch um, a dozen to two dozen. Yeah, so definitely not the mass populations you see out in not western Alaska. Yeah, yeah, no, I know I would say not. Yeah, which that's another interesting point. They have no sport fish value. Um, I caught one through the ice this weekend. They have no sport fish value. Um, <laughs> but uh, they, um, they are an important subsistence food. So that's one means of introduction that it, it's possible that's why they were introduced. And somebody was caught trying to release them a few years ago um, down on the Kenai, so. One more question. Hi, there's several areas in the valley where the habitat overlap does indeed exist. And there are areas where I would be seriously concerned about uh, a predator sink um, with salmonids from blackfish predation. And I, th I think your study would be really worthwhile to repeat here in the valley in several areas if you're interested. Yeah, I agree, because there is quite a bit more habitat overlap here in the valley than there was on the Kenai. Um, I don't work with invasive species anymore, so I'm just kind of mic dropping and, uh, you know, giving my presentation. But, um, yeah, I mean, I definitely agree. This is way more pertinent to the valley than it was to the Kenai, for sure. Um, and I think it's possible that there's more habitat overlap for vulnerable life stages of salmon than I found. So I think that's definitely an area of more research. 